All this right, conference and, will now be and just like to welcome everyone to this week's clean call and to start with does anybody have any announcements how, uh, how about a, how about a reminder announcement this is one jim callahan uh tamara is going to become a fellow of triple as uh, or officially uh brought into the roles I think coming yes. up and that's quite exciting and good I mean you're uh, she's in the education section primarily within AAAS which is very broad in its scope and um, I, ju I just think we should look to that and uh, there's so much crossover there's the meet the scientists there's the conference itself there's family science days um, I don't know this also chance of Tamara, Tamara says how how we can uh, link education at AAAS with what's going on with the with the fellow program. Well, you know, well, thanks a lot. I mean, well, one of the things that we can do is, uh, um, since I actually also is actually some more backstory to this. I also served as the um, as the uh, one of the um, members at large of the education section for four years, um, which it ended in 2018. Um, and during those years, we had a number of people from our community who were coming up through the leadership roles of the education section steering committee. Um, it was during those years that we actually got a lot more um, people involved in earth and climate education um, uh, to become fellows. Um, and so uh, now we actually have quite a few um, fellows, uh, quite a few compared to things like biology, we are tiny, but, um, uh, so that's 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 one way to to get engaged to get um, if if people are interested in um, present in in, in having um, symposiums at the AAAS meeting, um, they uh, you can submit um, uh, you can submit um, ideas or you can submit um, um, proposals to AAAS. Um, but the other the other thing that you can do is you can make those suggestions through the education steering committee for them to consider and move forward. That each committee can um, each committee can promote a particular um, a one particular symposium. The other thing that um, I am going to do, and so it'll give us even more connection to AAAS, is that um, the steering committee asked if I would be the next secretary of the steering committee. And um, because it's such a, a complex job, it gives you connections with throughout AAAS. I am going to mirror the or shadow the current secretary for a year, so I won't actually start until February of 2020. Um, but I will become more engaged with the processes and, and, and know much more about what um, uh, what can be we, what our community can do to to connect in to this. Uh, to AAAS, and I'm also as an as another add-on. I've been the NAGT's liaison to AAAS for the past, I think, maybe three or four years, and so I'll be doing that again this time too. And that gives us connections to both the not only the education section, but the atmospheric and hydrospheric science section, and the ge uh, geosciences and uh, geography section. Um, so those are all the connections. But thank you very much for the congratulations <laughs> you've earned it tamara absolutely thanks tamara yeah uh, congratulations yeah congratulations well, yeah um, so the official thing i think is on the 16th of february so a, a week and a half that's awesome um other announcements so I've got a, I've got a, just a question for the group. Um, if you're not aware, I put a couple of things in the chat window, but the Office of Climate Education in Paris uh, was formally announced in the recent past. Um, and I spent some time with them at the Global Climate Action Summit in September. Uh, and I noticed that they have a resource that they put out to support for teachers to support the IPCC 1.5 degree report. Um, and I put that link in there, but that it occurred to me that, you know, uh, we have a lot to collaborate with them. Um, and a lot of people in the world don't know the rich work the climate change education community in the United States are doing. So, um, to that end, I'm wondering if people on the call support the concept, and I can go to the leadership board to see if they concur, 
but I just want to get a feel of those who are on the call. Um, should we be an official partner of the Office of Climate Change, Climate Education? Um, all right, Jen, thank you. Yes, absolutely. It doesn't look like it's a lot of work and there's a lot of value there. And I also think that maybe they should present to the Clean Network about what they're doing, how they're doing it. Uh, I don't think they've done that yet. So the Office of Climate Education is out of what? I don't quite see it here on there. Well, the, the, the about is on their website. Oh, okay. um, so it was, it was start, if you go to the about us, I'll put that here just for those who can't find it. But uh, I mean, you know, they're, they're plugged in in partnering with the IPCC and the, uh, the UN process. So it, it's a, a smart alignment for us. Um, but, you know, our community is part of an international community, but we're just, I mean, this is part of the ECOS uh, group, but this is a different, a different process for that um, impulse to share what we've learned and benefit from what others have learned. Um, so it's just, an, it's just an idea. Uh, if you think it's a good idea and we should explore it as a leadership board, um, that's how we make decisions in clean. I'm just occurred to me. So what do you guys think? Anybody have a position? Uh, Frank, yeah, Jim, Jim, I've definitely been over their website and got to talk to them as well. I think they're doing very important work. They're very um, sincere people. I don't see any negative. You know, there's some organization that, well, there might be a, you know, something not so hot about this. You know, we're being too associated with them, but I think, I think it's fantastic. I think make, they're a great example for international collaboration. Gotcha. Yes. All right. Any, any other perspectives? I think it's hey, Abby, this, uh, Rusky. You go for it. Oh, okay, thanks. I, I was just wondering, what is the connection between this group and ECOS? Uh, to my knowledge, nothing. Okay. And, you know, and, and so, Abby, since you've been working with Mark as much as you have, um, I think that, you know, as ECOS seems like it's trying to reestablish itself or strengthen, um, I think that aligning, just like I put the link to partnering with uh, with them on in my chat, I think that there's no reason why um, Ecos couldn't also do the same. Anything that builds coherence in our community is is a healthy thing. Here, here, yeah, and and I I would um, think it'd be great for Clean to be part of uh, a partner with this network. That would be my vote. Okay, great. Somebody else? Yeah, this is uh, this is Patrick, and I just wanted to throw out there, I, I think it sounds like a good idea and uh, could be a really great partnership. Um, I'm reflecting a little bit, though, on the East meeting um, last month, in which we kind of took a step back and recognized that ESIP didn't have have a map of itself as far as the partners and networks that they were connected to, especially in relation to the work that they wanted to do. And mm -hmm. I think as we move forward with forming new partnerships, it would be greatly beneficial for us to create that map so we knew where we stood, what we were connected to, and where the gaps were, so that when we were considering new partnerships, we could do so in light of where we were connected and what we wanted to move forward. Uh it, it, Patrick, if you have ideas about how we could map ourselves or anybody in the network or know somebody who's really good at mapping networks, um, I, I, you got mad support from me. Just a matter of how we how we query the community and begin building that that would be useful. Definitely, and um, we can talk more about it later. Awesome. I think that's enough for now. Thank you all. Thanks, Frank. Um, other announcements? I don't know much about it, but I, uh, um, during the leadership call that happened right before this, I learned that there is a uh, climate day on Capitol Hill um, that maybe Wendy knows something about because AMS is a partner. <laughs> and I see Wendy's online. Um, uh, and I, I put it in the chat a bit ago. Um, 
Uh, I am sad to say that I have no additional info. Okay. Other than you, if AMS is involved, it would be through our policy program, and I haven't heard from them about it, but I can check. Okay, well, I will put that link in the chat again, so it's at the bottom of the list, um, and AGU has it listed on their website as well, um, but with less information than AMS has, so um, so it looks to me like AGU is a partner. It's March 12th and 13th. Um, uh, I am not going to be able to go, because I don't think anyway, because that's the end of that week is NAGT's board meeting, so I'll be in uh, Minnesota rather than DC. Um, but it, uh, I have gone to one congressional visit day back in September of 2017. And this is a special flavor congressional visit day uh, that looks like it would be good if, uh, if climate education was represented there. Yeah, but, I've done congressional visit days too. They're really an amazing opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really think everybody ought to do that. And AGU and AGI and GSA all collaborate on the geoscience congressional visit days. So um, if you're a member of any of those organizations, you can go. And they offer a, um, a half day of training the day before the visit days and, and some online stuff beforehand to get you ready to talk to staffers when you go. So that's what I know. Okay, great. Thanks, Don. Any other announcements? Yeah, th and this is Katie Boyd. Um, I just wanted to put in a quick plug for if anybody wants to present their work on the clean calls going into the future. I think about mid-March we start having um, openings again and need to fill up the schedule. So uh, just keep it in mind and let Patrick or I know if you want to present. I'll send an email to the Clean Network at some point in the near future about it too, but just throwing it out there. Hey, Katie, to, to that end, um, Abby, since you're on the call today with the all the, the work that's going on in Washington State, one possible idea is to start, if you feel that they're ready, start having some of those Washington State projects, you know, kind of presenting and um, to us or, or if you think that they're not ready or which ones of the 16 funded by the state's climate change education money. Yeah, just, that's a good idea. I'll look into yeah, that. Um, what, um, when is the next opening? Uh, March 19th. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd be happy to connect with you, Katie, to make a couple suggestions for that. Great. And Frank, yeah, I think it, it could be beneficial to this group to have, I don't know, Ellen or somebody come on and just give the overview. Absolutely. Um, and, and then maybe a few projects um that illustrate so but happy to follow up with is it katie yeah i'll Miss? type my i'll type my email into the chat here send me oh sorry at colorado.edu got I it submitted too early um that's one yeah. way to keep your uh, email from being spammed <laughs> I did it again. Sorry, it's colorado.edu. Um, yeah, send me an email, Abby. We'll, we'll let's talk about that. Okay, sounds great. Hey, Abby, you, you jog something for me. Uh, sorry, these 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 are going long. Sorry about that, Max. Um, uh, uh, Kristen Poppleton and myself, this is Frank Neeple at NOAA, in partnership with Ellen um, and her team in Washington State, are have been doing a webinar series to support those investments, the state investments. I put the link here. The next uh, webinar is on February 25th um, and uh, focused on K-12 educators and the National Climate Assessment and specifically the regional uh, Northwest regional assessment. We have a presenter from that team, um, but uh, and actually Cheryl Manning is going to be part of that. Uh, a lot of you know who she is. So, uh, but the, we're looking at some wider webinars related to this beyond this set of three. They're all recorded and available. There are two others that have been already recorded. Ben Santer did the last one um, on the fourth, which was yesterday, and it was awesome. So anyway, just just want to put it out there that that might be 
uh, a wider value for some other people on the call, um, but exploring some other webinars um, beyond this one. Uh, we'll talk about that once things get a little bit more detailed. Yeah, and I'll okay. just tell you that that's been a very, very um, wonderful start to a series that I'm sure is going to gain in momentum. And it was great to have a um, introduction to for Washington educators to the clean um, site and resources available. Right. Um, so, you know, going about sort of this systemic way of um getting that resource known and utilized and and contributed to is yeah, i think you're on a really good um trajectory with that frank thank you abby uh, Kristen takes a huge amount of credit on that one she's 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 got the ball rolling and and yes rolling she is. she's doing great yep okay um thanks everybody this was uh, a lot of announcements today a lot of things happening it's awesome very um, positive. Um, I'd like to transition to our today's presenter and I'll do a quick introduction and then hand it right off to Max. Uh, Max Boykoff is the director of the Center for Science and Technology Policy, which is part of the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences at UC Boulder. He is also an associate professor in the environmental studies program and faculty in the geography department. In addition, Max is a senior visiting research associate in the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford. He has interests in cultural politics and environmental government science, environmental communication, science policy interactions, political economy and the environment and, cl and climate adaptation. And he has experience working in North America, Central America, South Asia, Oceania, and Europe, and is a co-author and editor of six books and edited volumes, along with over 50 articles and book chapters. So very excited to hear his presentation today, and I'm just gonna hand it right over to you, Max. Welcome, and thanks for your time and being here today on The Clean Call. Oh, hello. Hello. Okay, great. Well, thank you all very much for inviting me in to these conversations. I think it's, I'm really happy to have this chance to connect with, with this group, with you all specifically, and um, really been pleased to continue to hear about how things are going through Patrick and his work that's going on here through Anna and others. Um, so today, what you can see, I think now, is the cover of a book that I've got coming out this summer. And so uh, this is essentially about how to get us unstuck from these conversations around climate change, uh, particularly here in the United States. You all know very well about how this can map on in certain unproductive ways into our politics, into our society, uh, into the ways in which we relate to one another on a personal level. And so this book project was really a good opportunity for me um, to be able to try to aggregate uh, a lot of the social sciences and humanities scholarship in these areas, basically to try and understand what works, where, when, why, how, under what circumstances. Uh, because in some ways, you've probably all had this experience where you've had outsiders, people who don't do this kind of work uh, on a daily, weekly basis like you all do, uh, asking, okay, so what is, what is this? silver bullet. And as I put in the summary for this talk, I mean, I think you all probably know well that there is no silver bu bullet, but it's a, a lot of different strategies and tactics that amount to what's been called oftentimes silver buckshot that help meet people where they are uh, and help different people meet uh, other people where they happen to be. And we're not all in the same place on this. And so you know, I think what I want to do, it's a bit, bit more self-referential than I'm used to, to be honest. Uh, but with this book coming out, what I think I want to do is maybe just refract some of the work that I've put into this book to help maybe generate discussion and some conversation with you all in the time that we've got. Uh, so I've prepared some slides along that, those lines. I've got 10 slides. And so essentially what I want to do just in the next couple of slides, see if this will work. Patrick, do you? 
that's not letting me advance. So just I'll, uh, there you go. So this may be a figure that you've seen before. It's a schematic that I've found useful over time, just in helping us sort of get our heads around the issues themselves. This comes from Granger Morgan's group at Carnegie Mellon. I've really found this to be helpful over time, basically three axes without dwelling too long. The, what, what this communicates to me is that the perceived domain of many climate engagements, the kinds of conversations that we have, often are out in the distance and away from our immediate circumstances. This uh, works against some of the feelings that people may have about, uh, if you look on the y-axis, the, the time scales that are needed to address this. Um, if you look on the x-axis, the kind of resources that are required, this isn't the kind of thing that can just be uh, resolved maybe at the edges of our workings of economy and society, but this cuts to the heart of all of that through carbon-based industry. And then on the z-axis, if you will, the cultural and political distance between people really places this outside the domain as they really talk about it of conventional policy problems. And I've adapted slightly to talk about uh, in terms of the kind of thing that people uh, tend to think is a problem but may not be their problem. And so that we can talk about that through some of the survey work. And I do talk a little bit about that in the book itself. Uh, but essentially, starting this book off, I talk about the here and now, and so to bring that into our everyday spaces. And in doing that, Andrew Hoffman is uh, somebody who you may be familiar with his work, so you may know him already. I think he does really good work. Uh, and in one of his short books that he wrote oh, not too long ago, he essentially made the argument that this debate is not about uh, the science anymore. It's about opposing cultural values and visions of the future. Sure. I think we can all agree on those things too by way of context. Nonetheless, the traditional historical conditions of engagement are in these familiar places and these kind of artifacts. I just pulled out some of them. I didn't put on the 1.5 degrees report or the recent national climate assessment, but you, you get the idea that science is a powerful way of knowing about these issues. With it can come this idea though that we just hit people over the head with science, they'll they'll take the right actions and everything will be sorted. I think you all know that experientially and academically over time that that hasn't got us to necessarily productive places. And so what Susie Mosier, who some of you may know, talks about is that she really says uh, in a lot of different ways through her body of research, effectively that providing information and filling knowledge gaps is great, uh, but it's not gonna create the kind of active engagement, the kind of sustained behavioral change that's needed to address the scale of these challenges. So over time, we've seen different moments crop up, even in just recent years. Uh, we've seen marches for climate, science, scientists out in the streets talking about how they've had to defend the process of advocating for evidence, advocating for facts. And this has generated opportunities for us to talk about this, perhaps meet people more effectively in the public sphere, unlike previous periods of time. So to dip into the, I guess I have another, I like that one, that's kind of my favorite, what do we want science-based policy after peer review? So the top line assessments in this book essentially are the following three. One, we need to get unstuck in our conversations uh, and we need to be creative about it at the science policy interface and in our everyday lives. Um, amidst high quality, well-funded scientific research into the causes and consequences of climate change, I think comparatively we haven't made a great deal of progress. And that is despite the work, the fantastic heroic work that many of you are doing in your organizations, but we need to do a lot more. Uh, and so the, I can talk through some, one of the chapters in particular talks about the locus of agency, how it often remains problematically stuck at solely at the individual level. And that can feed into an information deficit model that can block off pathways for collective engagement. Uh, it's not to say that that information isn't useful. It's also not to say that the individual level isn't resonant, but remaining just stuck in those places is part of the blockage uh, that we've, Based. Secondly, we just we need to continue to work to confront 
urgent needs to smarten up communications and so that they match the demands of a 21st century communications environment. If we were together, I'd ask you to raise your hands. I imagine that you've heard before many times, you know, just dumb it down for the general public. We'll sort this, we'll be more effective. It's, it's really the opposite, turning it on its head and thinking very, very carefully, systematically, methodically about how to, how to find common ground on these issues. And with that, uh, some of the 20, 20th century communications models no longer hold. Uh, and then third of three is just a sustained assessment that provides a useful and needed resource and guide for many audiences. So really, I mean, I saw this opportunity to write a book uh, on this topic as a real privilege that the reward system where I sit is such that I could uh, prioritize this kind of activity. And I hope that it then is useful. I'll say a little bit more about audiences, but I hope, hope that it's useful to then catalyze this more systematic and sustained assessment going forward rather than a piecemeal approach to understanding uh, through case studies what's working. So together, um, you know, the book works to understand what's working, where, when, why, how, under what conditions. It integrates these lessons, as I've mentioned, from social sciences and humanities, research as well as practices, and it seeks to overcome this silver bullet logic and helping to value and support the different smarter strategies that help meet varied audiences. So a note about audiences is that when I wrote this, it is an academic press, it's with Cambridge University Press. And so I'm trying to uh, run a line where I'm th my imagined audience, my perceived audience was very much researchers and practitioners. So many of you all um, who've worked to improve the effectiveness of climate communications over time. Also part of my imagined audience are students with whom Patrick and I work uh, regularly here at the university and with whom many of you are in uh, communication with. The, they're the new content producers. They're folks that were born into a world where this was already on the public agenda. Kind of a third layer of an imagined audience are natural scientists, physical scientists, policy decision makers themselves who who can incorporate some of these lessons into uh, their own approaches to these kinds of issues about communication. I'm sure that you've all encountered people too that, that work very sincerely from these other places, but um, fail to get a handle on uh, what research has told us and where there are lessons that have been learned that could be integrated for more effective communication. And then I think the last, layer of my imagined audience with all this is to uh, you know to have other influentials take notice about how to direct energies and frankly between us uh, direct some funding to support these kinds of efforts going forward that um, I've encountered many well-meaning uh, influential people who fail to I think understand the scale of what's needed to address the, the scale of challenges of, of effectively communicating about climate change. So the chosen title has sort of been lurking there for you. I actually just got this book cover uh, overnight that the image itself comes from James Baylog, who's here in Boulder and has done a lot of great work over the years through National Geographic and elsewhere. Um, and it's an effort, Amy Naku Schmidt, who works here with us, had tried to take a step back and provide some layer of representation. Uh, so that's what you have, that you're seeing in front of you. The title itself though, is really, um, has kind of two meanings. It's, it's hopefully not to be annoying or cheeky, but rather the creative communications part, I've really written this in a way that I try to then have transferable guidelines and rules, lessons that can apply to other uh, related issues. And secondly, as I'm sure you all know well also, but uh, I tried to put in here a firm argument that when you're mindful of audience and context, that creative and ultimately effective communications sometimes may importantly involve not explicitly invoking climate or climate change. And so not having to wear that on your sleeve, not having to win an argument, but to actually talk about things like 
uh, stewardship and responsibility. Um, it doesn't mean shying away from the issue by any means, but it's about finding that common ground. It, the book, I make an argument that there are definitely times and places to effectively make uh, your communication about climate change explicit, but there are definitely also times and places to embed these implicitly in other ways. And so, Frank, I'm happy to take a question. I can stop there. Sorry, Max. It just uh, this is a very um, uh, uh, pertinent uh, issue. Um, so uh, here's the question, and thank you for being flexible in the way you do this. Uh, I'm loving where you're going here. But this the this this piece about um, communication without explicitly getting into climate or climate change is it in your you know your experience and your your opinion that that's for some people whereas other people that's all they want to talk about like avoiding talking about it explicitly is actually a, a negative or a detriment or an undermines effectiveness in the engagement um does that does that make sense definitely so, yeah it's a great it's a great intervention thank you and anybody please jump in at any time uh uh, yeah, there's this clear pitfall of climate silence, of course, and I think that might be what you're getting at a little bit, is that if we avoid it too much, we're actually really not confronting the issues that we seek to address. Right. And so this is about smartening it up. Um, this is about listening, adapting to different uh, audiences to perhaps put winning of an argument uh, secondary to and talking people into something secondary to... Uh, actually just finding this common ground so I think you're absolutely right it's about there's a time and place for this and so the title itself is trying to play with that and draw that out I was um, you know I think we've all had those experiences and I've been struck though by how it hasn't really been uh, put together at least as far as I've found into a cogent thesis and so I'm hoping that this book will help people find that uh, foundation from which to talk effectively about that. I mean, we see examples about this all the time. Just in uh, an article recently, I saw that uh, the notion of speaking about climate change in Texas can be more effectively addressed through the discussion about future proofing. Some of you guys may have seen that article recently, but this is about recapturing a middle ground through creative uh, approaches, through multiple perspectives, by bringing in the arts as a, maybe a communication strategy. Uh, by bringing in other ways to then um, make this a more productive arena of engagement. So there's certainly a lot more that I can say about it. I've written a book about it. And so um, what I will just say in, in turning the page to the next slide is that this is about tailored communications. Um, and it's also about overcoming that silver bullet logic. So I think hopefully, Frank, that answered your question or at least addressed your your comment. So Max, I'll, I'll, go, one, I'll go one step further. Um, the 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 tendency to accommodate those who this who want to avoid or are very um, challenged in this conversation, thereby the you know they don't really want to talk about climate. But if you look at Six America's research, that's like a small part of the nation. But that I, I think you called it climate silence. Um, yep. But there's that that over 50 percent who are alarmed and concerned. And somehow we don't focus on them. We always focus on the 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 ones who are really resistant or hard to talk to. But there's another strategy. And I'm, I'm curious to see if you see that as well where we need to talk to them as well. The yeah. long term. You're absolutely right. And that's part of that tailored engagement. Perfect. And the work of Tony Leiserwitz, Ed Maybach, and the groups there, Yale and George Mason, have really helped to open up uh, and increase the sophistication and maturation of those discussions about the different groups um, and what can then be tailored engagement to address their concerns and to find productive ways to, to have these conversations. I absolutely agree. And so it's, again, climate is in the title, it's in parentheses, it's about to, uh, discretion is advised, uh, but climate silence is absolutely a pitfall of avoiding this altogether. 
I can spin off into a lot of other examples and we've done that a bit in the book, uh, but we've probably seen over time that engagements say the Obama administration, Obama first term versus Obama second term were very different approaches in the ways in which they explicitly addressed uh, climate change. And having had a few conversations with folks that were part of that, uh, you know, it was some strategy to then reach across the aisle to meet uh, what might be a minority, but could be a very voluble minority or influential minority that are happy to talk about stewardship, happy to talk about economics of renewables, but, but unhappy to talk about climate change and some of the maybe cultural uh, and ideological um, uh, elements that get stirred up when having those discussions. So the book gets into a lot of different things. Um, I start by talking about post-truth and fake news and, and how we've gotten to the place where we are now. Um, talk about the value of interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, I have commitments to this kind of work. Talk about uh, how really what I feel as though I can add to these discussions is how research has been brought into these um, arenas of informed practice. And so in doing that, you know, I, I um, actually spend some time in a chapter going through some of the work that uh, Sander van der Linden, Tony Leiserwitz, Ed Maybach, there's a whole group, John Cook, who have really developed a uh, powerful communication strategy around 97% of scientists agreeing that humans contribute to climate change. Dan Cahan has, has uh, objected to this meme and talked about uh, different cultural tribes. Um, there's another, I think, uh, at University of Michigan, Josh Pasek, who had written a really interesting bit of research up about what he called not my consensus, where some folks felt quite alienated by this notion of 97% are on board and you should get on board too. Uh, and so it really was an opportunity for me to wend my way through and bring in what we may have been hearing about. I, I imagine that, that you all, when I bring this up, you've all been reading about some of this, you've been having conversations about it, you probably talked with some of the authors about this, but trying a long form treatment of where that gets us and what are some of the pitfalls and drawbacks of taking up that stance. So there's a lot of different things that I cover. Um, what I try to get to though in this next slide is I realize that in order to integrate lessons, uh, learned that I need to highlight what are some of the ways that have been successful and what are some of the rules of the road. And so I resisted some disembodied uh, recipe book because that would not quite get us there, but rather thinking about how within certain contexts, there are ways in which we found that we can open up these conversations more than close them down. And so that list of the the five there, I get into some detail about what I mean by each of them, but basically rules of the road. Now these don't hold in all conditions either. I've been frustrated, you know, I study as part of my research, climate contrarian communities, and I've been uh, put in positions where I have to debate them. Uh, I'd like to think that I do it authentically, ambitiously, accurately, imaginatively, and bold, but uh, I also don't do it uh, in a way that, that uh, also softens my position. And so if you read into the details here, none of this necessarily is prescriptive as to how you engage, but rather just some rules of the road for engagement. So then the next five that I have written up in the book and I have for you here are some that, that um, are propped up then by a lot of research that I delve into in detail. So finding common ground, meeting them where they are, Emphasizing how it affects us here and now instead of that distant future and, and other place and other people. Uh, thirdly, focusing in on how it actually makes our lives and livelihoods better by confronting this issue. That can get overlooked at times. Fourth, empowering people to take meaningful and purposeful action. And then fifth, returning to this notion of smartening it up in a 21st century communications environment. And so there are lots of different examples that I that I bring in, and I really um, treated it as a good opportunity to get into a lot of the different uh, research 
projects that have been taking place at all scales and with different groups around the world to help distill it into these features. Again, not prescriptive, but just some sort of guidance. And so with that though, I will mention for those who may not have heard about this before that I am an embedded actor here that, that um, I've been a part of a project now since 2012 here at the University of Colorado, working with uh, other professors, working with Patrick Chandler here, um, working with other grad students and, and many others with Anna Gold and others, uh, uh, not just here at the university, but, but outside of the university, Jim Balog. In fact, we just came from a session where we had Jim Balog and we were screening his film this morning as part of Inside the Greenhouse. Basically, it's a set of commitments that, that back Beth Osnes in the theater department here, Rebecca Safran, who's in ecology and evolutionary biology, Pedro Pizzullo, who's a communications professor, and I have made to provide this experimental living laboratory uh, here. It's work in progress. We seek to empower students with whom we work to be creative, and we partner with outside groups. And I can certainly provide lots of examples about ways in which we've been trying to increase the sophistication and help to, in our way from where we sit to smarten up these communication processes. So to finish, I think this is my last slide that I've got, is that this is the table of contents. I mean, I went my way through a lot of other issues that I, that I don't, don't mention here. Among them, I have a chapter about the role of academic climate ad advocacy and activism. Um, that comes out in part from a uh, climatic change journal article that has just come out with um, David Unk, who's here at the university, and me. Uh, but I, but I um, expound on that a bit in there. But just to focus in on that last chapter, then in terms of the search for meaning, that this is about ultimately helping to foster pathways for people to find meaning and purpose in their shared lives, our shared lives, finding meaning in struggle. Uh, communicating and understanding where people are coming from. Um, I do then talk about some of the misperceptions about young people nowadays. I think nostalgia can be a very powerful intoxicant. And so I get into some of that about yearning for this idyllic or Edenic past, that things aren't the way they used to be. That's, there's no doubt about that. However, um, millennials, Generation Z, however you want to frame it, are uh, better equipped now than ever to be taking on and confronting these challenges. And so, I walk through some of the ways in which that's been done and, and point to some of the young people taking these things on. And so for me, that's about encouraging new knowledge brokers. It's about helping facilitate some of this more work that needs to be done. Um, and it is, again, about supporting, at least from where I sit, the, the uh, connections between ongoing social science and humanities research with practice. And I mean, I think that really cuts to the heart of all the great work that you're all doing within the clean network, not all of it, but some of it, uh, that it is about these connections. And so to help us get unstuck, uh, I should have put get unstuck rather than getting stuck, that uh, there needs to be uh, sustained engagement. So I hope that this book will be helpful in that regard. So I think I'll stop there. It still gives us 15 minutes for conversation and I'm happy to field any questions. Does that seem like a decent stopping place? So thanks everybody for your attention and I'm happy to listen to your questions or comments. Hi, Max, Jim Kelly. Um, and this, some of what I'm gonna say is gonna echo uh, Frank's comment. Because I think what he said, I think we're, we're agreeing, but what he said is, is very important with things. This would be one of looking at what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing about your book. It would, I would say, it resonates very much with experience as a climate educator of what you know the rules of the road. A lot of things you're saying are, I think, are very good advice. They match with our experience. If we, um, and there would be a thing of when you had the the three dimensional model. It might even be. I, I, these are ones of like minor things you might say that put your book, no book is going to do everything, right? It's going to, it's going to have certain things, but minor one of almost like there's a fourth dimension. This gets into Frank's thing of how we, and sorry, if I tell me if I misrepresented Frank, I don't mean to do that, that, um, the, the, that people are, are at all these different levels, 
it's often different parts of the country, different different things. I'll tend to work, for instance, our organization tends to work with people, uh, say in California or the state of Maryland or Washington D.C., where the students, the families, the board of education, the city, the state are all saying, yeah, 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 of course the science is right. What can we do? We want to learn how to, our workforce to take this on. We want to understand these things. We want the science to use that. And we'll, we have humanities teachers and science teachers all working together, for instance, in Washington, D.C., of how you help Washington, D.C. save energy on the citywide level or at 100,000 level. That What I'm getting at is that these rules of the road, I think, can apply when it's not a when when the question of not being unstuck like you're bringing out is we don't want the people who are wanting to move who want to learn to do you know actively want to learn how do we how can you empower us to do this to them not be stuck waiting on the people who go argue that it's a chinese conspiracy or something right but if you're yes. so, i mean i don't know that was a lot of a comment but maybe your reaction to that yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And so when I talked about the audiences, I guess that kind of fourth audience that are the influentials, that uh, I do hope that this has some imprint on their th thinking about how to then f help people not get stuck if they're ready to go and their leadership isn't ready to to uh, to help that kind of pathway. If we talk about, say, decarbonization among them, that, that there are at these different levels uh, opportunities for people to get plugged in and to get to work. So I, I, I agree. This is Abby, and um, thank you for the presentation. I, I am really um, very in, interested in in your book, and we'll definitely get it when it's out. So I hope you'll let this network know when that day arrives. One of the things I'm, I'm most interested in is this idea of smarter um, and uh, kind of playing a little bit more to what Frank was saying and how to reach the growing majority that is now really maybe not wanting to, to culturally or even you know psychologically face the reality and make changes but are um, seeing it and are um, agreeing that it's a problem um, themselves. So what, in my experience working in um, sort of at scale from the local kind of to the international levels um, and looking at some of the ways of applying drawdown and having that be operational where I live, um, the, the use of math and actually being able to quantify um, at every possible grain size um, what is going on and what can be done about it at those different cultural levels, um, I think is very powerful stuff to in moving in the direction of this idea of smarter thinking, acting smarter. Um, and I'm not a mathematician, <laughs> so um, I, I'm really been inspired, though, to really begin crunching that in my local context for what it is that we can do that's locally contextualized solutions um, that become very doable by individuals um, and collectives in the sort of population of uh, 10,000 to 100,000 uh, folks. So I think that's one piece. And another piece I want to add, sort of throw out is this dialectic that I think exists between those who believe in the silver buckshot and those who believe in what Hal Harvey calls the four zeros, zero net energy grid, transportation, uh, production, and um, buildings. And folks in that camp would come from your policy sort of leader from the environmental field of past you know, few decades who, who believe that it's all going to happen in the policy arena. It needs to be high level leadership or nothing. Um, and just wondering if you're, if you touch on that at all. Well, those are great comments. And um, just to respond to some of what you're saying, besides just simply agreeing is that, that um, 
one of the things that I've tried to do in the book, and I think I just kind of glossed over a little bit, is just really unpacking the different ways of learning and knowing for resonant communications. So I highlighted the scientific way of knowing just as a pathway into this discussion. But I try to get into and provide examples of ways to value experiential ways of knowing, emotional ways of knowing, uh, affective, aesthetic ways of knowing, and that's where the arts, and that's where even nonverbal communication um, becomes helpful. Uh, so that can reach different audiences. It can reach uh, folks in the policy community. It can start to break down some of the different ways of considering audience. I hope in a useful, in a useful way. And so, you know, I guess time will tell. I think that I have been way too self-referential in this presentation for you all, and I hope you'll forgive me. But when you pick up the book, you'll see a lot of work that that folks have been doing on the ground that are that's practical that has seen some semblance of success and research that has helped uh, bring to the fore certain things that are working that can then be uh, a guide and they can then be helpful in carrying out some of your ongoing work as well. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Alexandra. Um, I work for Mass Audubon, and um, thanks so much for your presentation. I was actually, I, I apologize, I didn't quite hear your comments um, just because of feedback um, when you were talking about the statistic about 97% of scientists are in agreement. And I was just wondering if you could touch on that point again, because I felt like you were saying something that I hadn't heard before, but I couldn't quite tell because I couldn't hear all the comments. Sure. If I just, can you still see me? moving these slides around? I can, yes. Okay. Um, so really in the middle, uh, well, it's chapter five, where I delve into that 97% of scientists and I really talk about different scales of engagement. And mm -hmm. um, there has been a great deal of research that's come through by, I mentioned John Cook, Sander van der Linden, Anthony Lazarowitz, Lazarowitz, uh, Ed Maybach, others many others that have found that to be a very effective uh, communication tool to say that there are, is this uh, overwhelming consensus or convergent agreement that humans contribute to the climate, climate change. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. but there is still a body of work that uh, pushes back against that a little bit, including Dan Cahan's work at Yale. And so I delve into some of that. I mentioned Josh Pasek with an interesting work out of Michigan, where some folks feel alienated uh, and it actually works as a repellent. And it's just an example of the ways in which you have to be, you have to tailor communications. You have to be very careful about uh, uh, not thinking that by communicating 97% of scientists agree this, uh, that it will be that silver bullet that then, uh, that then um, prompts, inspires engagement overall. Now that can be resonant for certain uh, audiences and so that particular chapter helps bridge from the individual to the collective to try and draw out what are the benefits that come from uh, that kind of a communication strategy and what still needs to be done beyond that hope that answers the question yeah thank you Hey, Max, this is Frank again. Unless somebody else has a burning question, I have a follow-up one. Great. Uh, not, not hearing anything. Uh, so what do you see um, of how this would be implemented? Meaning the, the, the book is informing the process, but in some ways, right? Um, but but I imagine you've got some thoughts about how to actually bring that into practice. Um, and if you have, would you mind sharing them with us of how, how you think we would ask in communities actually take this, your, your research based, you know, conclusions and bring them into practice? Yeah, that's a great question. It gets to the heart. I mean, 
having this conversation with you all, I'm mindful of the fact that, that you all are all as well informed on these issues as anybody. And so uh, hopefully providing this long form treatment of these kinds of issues, you can uh, connect up some of the things that you've been reading about, some of the things that you sense may work, and that can empower you to then maybe use these rules of the road, use these features of a roadmap to uh, tailor communications more effectively than you're already doing for certain audiences. And so for you as, as, all, as an audience that's already engaged, already professionally and personally committed to many of these um, sorts of challenges, I hope that this will be a helpful foundation for you to carry out this work. It's not prescriptive. Again, it's not a disembodied context-free recipe book, uh, but it is just helping to illuminate certain things that have worked. And I, while I think you guys have all done a lot of this work and already have a good sense of it, I think it's really difficult to get the time and space to read up on all of these different studies that have taken place in different places and just alone have access to to where they're coming out and so forth and so on. So I read my brains out. I did a lot of work to um, try and connect up commonalities between these research projects so that hopefully it also functions. I mean, it is, I had referenced, it's about, I forget, about 120,000 word book, but 25,000 words of it are, are references so that hopefully when you read into something, you say, oh, hey, that, that's something I want to learn more about. Hopefully this provides a pathway for you all to dig in more deeply into those uh, specifics. That's a great answer, Max. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, we're um, nearing the top of the hour, but we could have time for any other last questions for Max. When's the book coming out exactly? I'm sorry, I'm pushing the time. Yeah, I'm pushing the timeline for summer and hopefully right. turning stuff around quickly enough so it'll be a summer book. Great. Great. Well, thanks well, everybody for the work yeah. that you all do. I'm going to thank you all. Um, so I appreciate the Clean Network. I appreciate the efforts that you've all uh, put in. So it's really, a, it's it's nice to have this, this opportunity to share with you some of the work I've been doing. Yeah, thank you so much, Max, for your time today. And please make sure that um, when it when it comes time for your book to to uh, come out, please make sure you send a message out to our network so we can um, check it out. Great, thank you. Great, um, thanks everybody, and I hope that you have a good week and look forward to talking again next week. So thanks again. Thanks, Thanks, all. Everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care.